please feel free to touch. That's the other thing here, <laughs> is that we're so used to saying you can't touch art. And what I love is you cannot get away from being part of it. How did you learn how to paint like this? You know, uh, none of this was um, uh, intentional. It, it's come from this. I was showing, the, you got here a little bit afterward. But if you notice this re reoccurring figure, this is the watcher figure, this figure over and over again. And it's a language that I've really been following very much like liquid music, seeing like a jazz improvisation where this goes. And that's why it's been unfolding with this story that, that calls itself the hieroglyph of the human soul, that it's making me very uh, excited in the terms of what it's reminding us, is that it's not that we have to figure these things out, we really have to start giving permission to get out of the way because, as I say, as an actor, you never know how to play a part. You never know how to do it. So if you enter into that mystery and you, you attend it, then it starts to cultivate itself through you, to mentor you. And I think we know this creatively and imaginatively, but there's been this sort of mid-level management mind that's been the overlay of the planet. You know, what's the bottom line? What's the, and as we know, that's, that's a good way to shoot and kill a creative impulse. <laughs> so. The cathedrals, and we see the labyrinth, and we see uh, the the topiary, the gardens. That that everything there was this story that that because we're composed of these patterns, we're not really learning them. That as we walk them, we take them back in. We start to uh, really allow that energy to reanimate itself, and that's why this story, as you just circumnambulate, as you as you go around in the circle, do feel as as you're moving how. Uh, the images move up, move into you, move through you, what they trigger, because this is something that, you know, if we think about the imagination, that's not actually going somewhere literally. That's going somewhere transformatively, meaning that we're allowing those elements to once again trigger a sense of a for instance, oh, I like that, I like this story. And that's the, the story here, as I say, is the hieroglyph of the human soul This began on 9-11 when the towers came down and it's been growing every day since and I continue to work on it and if you have not we will have to circulate out to the outside to see another uh, it's called Mothership Revelations in Pink. What we'll talk about downstairs as well with 12-12-12 is this this coming full circle and as you walk even you can feel how you're coming full circle and you're going to actually be able to take in the whole library I, I feel that because everything in, in this work shows itself as a wheel, right. that I think although I went in directions, that literally it was much more a type of nonlinear conversation. That, like when I look at the oil paintings, these really feel much more, um, uh, they're, they're registers completely. And I felt very classical. I felt like they were like Beethoven, they were classical right. uh, tone poems. And then when it went down to the floor and it went into acrylic, the, the color spectrum changed. Yeah. Um, the, the relation, everything I would paint then changed what was painted, how it was painted. And, I, and, and so this has been a great teaching entity for me, meaning that, that although I would have thought, you know, in terms of, of as a painter, that, that you really can't, these are the things I, I thought were the penultimate, that this is something that, but then when it went this other direction, I just thought, and it was the actor in me that said, get out of the way of the better story. You think you're making it up, and then suddenly something's making it up through you, and you go, this is so much better. And that's why, you know, so much of this is about the etiquette of energy. It's like just trying to now, in each of us, give ourselves permission to start to pay attention to that which does sort of come up oftentimes with a bit of folly, like humor. Like you'll notice a lot of the humor in here because even here, Eve appears on a lamp. But look at this, it's a light. So, so think about the light of mind being a lamp. You, you have to, or the lamp unto my feet. You know, this, there's so much joy in terms of when the palette isn't just painting something, but the entire environment becomes a living palette. And as it flows, it starts to take in, as I say, the light of mind. We'll move into the knowledge of Sophia and the cabinets. And when I open the cabinets, we will see this story that says it wasn't, uh, you misunderstood me. Uh, I didn't say the higher and lower self. I said, as we'll see here, the higher and lower shelf. <laughs> 
And you have to love laughter. Do you know, it's almost like we get too, too like, this is really serious, and then we go, oh, I can't understand this. And what I love is that the, the higher and lower shelf are saying, listen, and this is what she asks. She says, what are you woven of? Me, matter, mater, mother. If you, you, you look here, you see clay, salt, and water, and you arise to hold that higher shelf, and the higher shelf has the patterns, the ratios, the mathematics that inform not just your form, but all form. So what do we have then? Pattern, potter, father, matter, mater, mother. The, yeah, and you see, in the two qualities of oneness, behind the outer face of beauty and manifestation, told in a domestic cabinet. <laughs> See, William Blake would have loved that. He would have said, of course, if you can't find it where you live, you're not going to find it in the church. You're not going to find it in your neighbor's house. And that story then, of she says, so look, you see, now I return the cross, and it's no longer the cross of death, but the gift of life. When you see this, you see the chalice, the grail, over the spines of the books of religion that say that we've journeyed through time and tradition, and on the spine of every tradition is a unique beauty but nothing's being lost. That's the other thing I like about the library metaphor. The library's going, do you think I'm gonna lose some of this? The question's so remarkable, I had to ask it across the ages. But now we finally return home, put our hand in the mouth of the serpent, here our other hand here, and we become, do you see the loop of infinity? We become the outpouring of all of this knowing. And that's where she says yes. And think of the quantum question. If we can see the location, we can't see the speed. If we see the speed, we can't see the location. Now, let's put it this way. If we see the blossom, our purpose, we might not be able to see our energy. And this is what, what and where we will find the goddess and Lilith, because she says, now that you've matured a bit, I'll re-reveal myself by turning outward <laughs> to reveal the erotic key to creation. And notice the spines of the books of my uh, family photo albums. We have the apples that are the, apple, the umbilical apple tree. And I'm convinced that the question of the apple was the question of this unique creation, this unique artistry. And think about the story here where she says, because in myth, Lilith is the first wife of Adam. She's sent away because she won't submit to Adam. She won't say, oh, yeah, you're above me. She knows better than that. She says, I'm the goddess, and I will not forget what I know. And the question on this little planet was, how does man and woman, Adam and Eve, both forget their source so that they look at each other, and they look into each other's eyes, and they begin to trust the love that grows between each other? Think about trying to grow intimacy. You would have to trust that intimacy. So this is where the myth changes now, because she says, ah, you see, so Lilith is actually the goddess who sacrifices herself. She turns herself inward in woman, becoming Sekhmet, the lioness, that will survive the betrayal of her beloved when he turns towards self-reflection and says, I'll get back to you, darling, but my relationship with God, who's in that mirror somewhere, is more interesting. And that's why she says, so you see, I turned myself inward so that you could blossom. And if you see it, you can now understand that you can actually bring and allow me to join in this greater journey. And that's why I can even move this now. I like to, to it's all movable. The Tibetans taught us well because in healing they said, you know, a lot of times we want to be able to have movable uh, pieces so we're able to actually walk. And that's why now as you walk this, you'll be able to walk between Lilith and as I showed you on the pillar, Eve, and this story that we're actually walking into and this will, be, this will be part of the, the, the journey of, as we started talking, about the right angle. Notice this right angle. This is very important because this will talk about, you know, Jung talked about individuation, Carl Jung. He said, he said that, that individuation is the process of really understanding that we are not the same, that there is something unique within me that I must bring forth. And if we think of that as not just ourselves, but really the journey of our human story for thousands of years now will begin to make more sense of why it's been so difficult. And that's kind of what I want to talk about downstairs as well, because the question is, why would a species go through so much pain? You know, why would we endure the unendurable for so long? It's not just one time or another. It's life after life after life. 
And the story is that, that we literally, from the time of the ancestors, the knowledge of the mother, which is I love, therefore I am, we turned a corner toward the West, toward the mirror of self-reflection and unique identity. And think about that. What happens when you look in a mirror? Suddenly, I've got to get into that library. I've got to get into that other room. And as a matter of fact, when I turned a corner, I saw a guy looking back at me, and I thought, oh, God must be a guy. This is great. <laughs> What's really cool is, no, I'm not kidding, because when I'm angry, God's angry. We're going to have a great relationship. I'll be back, darling. And this, this story that finally we've reached the point where there's no further to go, and this is part of what we're going to talk about tonight, because the Maya talk about the end of the fourth world. And if we think about these as quadrants, the moving through the different worlds, and the last journey of this world was the ego, self-reflection. How am I different from you? So I turn away from the knowledge of the ancestors. I turn towards self-reflection. I turn back, and I can't see where I'm from. I don't know who I am. So I think I have to go further and further into this until I finally come to this moment. And this is about the solstice coming up in a few days. It's that we finally hold seed and blossom, alpha, omega, love, and thought, and understand that there's no, in a, in a way, the, the self-reflection is not very deep, and trying to get somewhere is not very meaningful at this point, because it's actually turning us back in to the story that we're the outcome. We are the living library, and therefore, in, in coming back home, it's saying, so this can be a cave painting. Just storytelling, paint, and imagination. Because like rings in a tree now, you are composed of this greater technology. This technology, and that's the genius of this place, says, I will become anything you're willing to ask and take responsibility for. We change the world by changing our assumptions about the world. We change the world by allowing ourselves to tell a more interesting story about who we think we are. If we're telling ourselves a story we don't like, if we're getting here and going, you know, you're shorter, taller, younger, older than all these things you're in reflection with, it's doing this. And this is why I think there's so much depression right now, is that people have reached this point, and we thought by this point we would see God. And all we see is our self. And it's like, oh, God, I'm not enough. I can't get there, and I'm not enough. But think about that finally turning the ego away and saying, did you ever figure out how to love? Did you ever figure out how to have compassion? Did you ever figure out how to hold your child and have your heart open as though there's, there's a, a true miracle happening? Of course not, because the most interesting elements of our humanity are not the things we ever prove. They're the things that inspire us to grow more beautiful gardens, to tell more loving stories. And that's why I think art is so important, is because it never says you have to believe any of this. It just is maybe we're much more interesting than we think. And that's why this turning away finally will lead us into this direction where we're going to move, hold our multidimensional origins. And I say, feel like this is the other thing. Start feeling like starship captains. I really want us to feel like gyroscopes. It's like, listen, these eyes, this ascension, this duality has taught us to differentiate between this and that, yes and no, love and thought, day and night. But now, like a gyroscope, and that's why I say I haven't gone mad doing this. As crazy as this is, I'm not crazy. It's very important because I really feel that, that it's telling the psyche that finally the imagination will not overwhelm us. It will not draw us into hallucination, but we can now hold the ring of structure, these eyes, and once again begin to trust the sense of wonder. The soft spot that in your baby's skull is open and they're like in this state of wonder. You see this with old people too when they die. They go back into this place of non-focus, but every, it's just absolute ambient aliveness. And I really feel that the key here is that we're starting to say, I will not lose my focus. I will not lose my practical capacity if I begin to trust my sense of wonder once again. If I start to say that maybe being human is a noble experiment, maybe it's worthy of this great question of who are we then. Do you know that's when we start to take back the theater, I'm convinced, of the story we tell. And that's when we re-enter then into this sense that we enter the mystery of time, we move toward ascension into duality, but finally we can take in the whole of the li living library. And the living library is what? Our DNA. It's our pattern 
matrix. So if I understand that it's not my personal psychology, but everything is human psychology I experience personally, then I understand that you too are given the piano. I'm given the piano. We play different notes, we play different compositions, but the genius of the place is we're meant to play. And that's what I feel is so much. So let's just, I'll just walk you out to this and then we'll go downstairs. I want to share with you the story out here on the deck, if we can fit. I started it as exploring an orb. My dad, who was a painter, he said, when you can't talk about it, paint it. So I would always use painting as a way of asking questions, not with a sense of trying to illustrate something I thought I knew, but to see where it took me. So I started with the orb and I ended up with basically the story of the revelations in black and white. Yeah, 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 we've all read it. It doesn't end well. Nobody's happy, so let's lighten up. How about a little revelations in pink? So come on out, huh? <laughs> this is the... Hi. <laughs> Good to see you. How have you been? Oops, sorry. That, yeah, watch that. Watch this. This is the... Don't want to trip over this... Uh... Can we? Look how cool that is, And I have a few slides of this, which I'll, 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 I'll talk about a bit. But just in terms of our story tonight and 12, 12, 12, excuse me, and returning home, that the story she's going to tell us about returning home, about making sense of the tears, of the sorrow of the journey, and the knowledge of the mother, the knowledge of the deep feminine, is she says, I remind you that I'm the great mother and I remind you that you're born of my absolute generosity. But I now remind you that your being is born of the infinite generosity of universes. I'm the knowledge of your atoms. I'm the knowledge of your energy. Your father Adam is the knowledge of your form. Therefore, my first question to you is when did your atoms become so generous to stick together to create one of you? When you understand that level of generosity, you begin to have a sense of who you really are. And she says, but to know this, because again, the sense of the sorrows of the journey, that for us to blossom, we've needed to separate. This is what we'll see here. And the story is, we'll also see this cross of matter, mater, mother, meaning this process of ensheathing. And actually, why don't you put your left and right foot on either side of the eye? Because this is all interactive, and it's very important, because in, in, anybody who stands here is being told... Uh, and so much of this has to do with both hemispheres of the brain. Basically, there's, a, there's an analogy, physiologically, that you're, you are an ancient tree growing out of the vision of innocence and ancientness. And just as you began in your mother's womb going through a process of ensheathing, notice how as you move toward her, this cross moves up within you. This is very important because what this is telling us is that what we see in the womb when we go from the reptilian to the mammalian to the hominid, it's like rings in a tree meaning that it's saying that everything grows out of the foundation which precedes it. Therefore, you will grow out of this shared nobility of species and, and, and being. And that's why when we think about our early cultures, they begin with the ancestors. Do not forget who you are. They begin with the mother. Do not forget the grotto or the cave, birth. Because we are wanting to have the body prepared to finally turn outward. It's not to stay there. And this is where, do you see, it becomes phallic, masculine. <laughs> and the story is... We, we, we thought we were going to have some nice and cozy place to stay, but we were thrust back out because we're very curious beings, but now we're going to be thrust out of, and this is very, of course, very important, the four directions will keep us posted. We're going to be thrust out of the eaves toward, and I kid you not, on the other side of that is a pine tree. So I say we're thrust out toward the world we pine for. We can't get to what we pine for because it's obvious. We see the railing right here. We're railing all the time. And that's the story is that maybe all of that railing that we're not getting what we think we want is saving us from a precipitous fall. And the story now is that like the two hemispheres, first we went in and then we went out. But now we can say, is it a question of shared reality or of energy? And that's where she says, yes, now you see, this is the knowledge of the chalice. And this is what we'll get into now when we get downstairs because in alchemy and hermeticism and all the ancient traditions, the knowledge of uh, of the mother, of matter, matter, was the knowledge of the blood, of the first principle, life. And therefore we're born through the mother, as we can see, as both male and female, until we finally achieve, as her body shows us, here her hips become the head of the hummingbird, here its beak, and finally we see its wings, 
and so we've been learning to achieve stillness while in motion. This allows us to not need to go any further, and as we do then, she says, all is energy. There are no evil atoms. If you don't like the stories you tell, tell better stories. Begin with the one you tell yourself about yourself. I love all of my children. I embrace the right, I embrace the left. I give no one permission to brutalize anyone for any reason. Figure it out. And think about that, you know. Cindy, you can't shoot your brother Steve. You have to figure it out. <laughs> so anyway, and that's and that I feel is, and this is what we'll get into now, is that we've really measured all things with the Vitruvian Man of Leonardo, but now we're embracing the truth that our, our masculine within male and female can hold a unique identity, but the feminine says, trust your ancient energies. You will not be lost nor dissolved. You will reawaken to the truth of your great journey. So welcome home. Let's go downstairs. <laughs> Thanks.